Hey all, today we're talking about advanced typing in Python, uh, specifically type vars, generics, and protocols. Uh, my name is Chris Volney. I'm a senior software engineer with Duo Security, working on the Cloud SSO services team. Um, recapping what we've already seen a bunch about Python typing, there are three uh, Python enhanced proposals, um, PEPs, that are related to this. Uh, probably the oldest one that we've seen the most of is 3107, that is how to define function annotations. Um, this has been around for a while. We've been using this for a while. Uh, the, the more recent features that we're more interested in is 483 and 484. Uh, 484 is actually how we implement uh, type hints within Python. Uh, 483 is more of the theory. Um, goes into some of the details that I'm going to gloss over real quick here. Uh, as a reminder, this is a tool for static code analysis only. There are, by default, no runtime implications. We can, however, as we get into looking at protocols and, and generics, we can apply decorators like runtime checkable that would allow us to use some of these tools uh, as part of like an in is instance call, for example. Um, we can use native types to annotate. So if we just want a dict or a string, uh, we can go ahead and use those by name. Uh, we can also use generics defined under the typing namespace. So here's an example of a dictionary that has absolutely a string key, uh, but can have anything in the value bucket. Um, and we can also define forward references by instead of giving the type, uh, we just put a string that is the type name. Uh, so an example of this is as the analyzer is running, if tree, the type, is not defined yet but will be resolved later, this will create a reference that will allow us to fulfill that at a later time. If you don't define a type called tree, it will give you an error eventually. So some examples of typing that we uh, see out in the wild. Uh, here's the most basic one. This is a function that takes a string, gives a string. And so those annotations are this colon on arguments. And before the colon for the function definition, we put this arrow that says it's going to return a string. Here's an alias. We'll get into more of this later. But basically, it's a variable assignment that a URL is a string. Uh, here's an example of some annotations uh, for callables. Uh, so in this particular case, uh, the first one here is a callable with no arguments uh, that will return a string. Then we have two other callables here. One takes an integer, returns nothing. The other takes an integer and an exception and returns nothing. Uh, this looks a lot like kind of your JavaScript async handlers. Uh, next up is we have type constraints inside of a type var. We'll get more into this later, but basically for something to fit into an any string bucket, it has to be a text or it has to be bytes. We can also annotate generators. I do not want to get into this too much. I think other people have talked a lot about this already, but uh, the peps are out there if you want to go ahead and look this up. You can type annotate your asynchronous functions, which is pretty cool. And on top of that, if you have asynchronous results that come out of a function that you are not awaiting, so if you're not within an asynchronous context, you need to return the awaitable, you can actually decorate your function or annotate your functions in such a way to convey that information. So in this particular case, uh, the implication is that both of these uh, return paths would return an awaitable that does resolve to a string. Additionally, uh, we have the idea of unions and the special format of a union optional. So both of these are the same. Uh, in this top one, it's basically saying the variable can be either an employee or none. The bottom one is doing the same thing. It is saying that E is an optional value. Uh, it could be none otherwise. Um, unions are, are pretty helpful if you wanted to say accept an employee or a contractor. Um, you wouldn't Maybe you, maybe you wouldn't want to say optional union. You might want to just put none into the list. So I think that's the like one time in the wild where I've uh, seen in like approved code that, that looks this way. OK, so digging a little deeper into type bars, as promised, aliases are just simple variable assignments. This is really neat. Um, we use these all the time, variable assignments. We might as well use it for type annotations, too. So in this particular case, uh, we're defining a new type called URL that is just a string. They're equal. 
Um, but it does convey a little bit more information, or maybe um, in this particular case, they're both three, three characters. But if it was a longer string, we'll have an example of that later. Uh, it might just be easier to type out URL. Additionally, we talked about uh, type VARs for unions or type constraints. Uh, so again, that example has to be either a text or a byte in order to fulfill this requirement of this annotation. Additionally, you can create upper binding on the types that can go into a type variable uh, bucket. And so in this particular case, um, anything that subclasses user, so maybe it's power user, maybe it's admin user, um, those can all be passed in in this particular case for this new user, uh, and then it will be returnable. Uh, so the buzzword for this is polymorphic inclusion. That is a, is a relationship of inheritance. Uh, additionally, we have this concept of invariant versus covariance versus contravariance. All variables, unless specified, are invariant. Uh, so here's an example from the PEP that talks about, um, basically the concern is if I have a list of a given type um, of employees, it might not be appropriate to put a different value in that inheritance tree uh, into that generic. So in this particular case, an immutable list, uh, we can go ahead and it can be covariant, which says we're allowed to shove additional types in there. Um, if it was contravariant, it behaves differently. I think what's more important is you go out to the uh, Stack Overflow or the PEP. Uh, here is, from the PEP, the very abstract algebra-esque explanation of how contravariance and, and covariance works. Um, you don't see a lot of these in the wild unless you are doing things specifically like mutating lists or, or other generics inside of your functions and you want to make sure that subclasses behave the way you're expecting them to. Moving on, uh, protocols, or I'm going to use the word interfaces here interchangeably. Uh, don't hold it against me. I came from a long Java background before this, uh, and that's just the word um, for that. But here's an example of we're defining some protocols. Um, so a web request protocol has just these three attributes on there. These can actually be fulfilled by properties you know, the app property. So they don't just have to be simple string variables. They can be more complicated in the back end, but it doesn't really matter to this as long as it fulfills this contract of the interface. Um, web request handler, the same thing. We're basically just defining, here's a, a attribute that's going to be attached to this. And additionally, here are some methods and how we expect them to behave. Given that information, we can go ahead and write other classes against those protocols. So we don't care about what the implementation details are, just the fact that the implementations have to conform to this contract. So again, protocols enforce an interface, not an inheritance hierarchy. A lot of people look at this and say, well, I use abstract base classes everywhere. Why not just make these abstract methods? Well, you could. Uh, but here's an example of simple request handler is not a web request handler, but it does conform to the, the interface that we've defined. So you don't have to couple necessarily uh, between your libraries in this inheritance chain. Uh, you can instead just implement the protocol and it will just work. Moving along, uh, I mentioned generics earlier. Let's talk about user-defined generic types. So this is stuff that you write. So in this particular case, I'm going to make a type var called body type. Uh, this is going to represent the request body of some generic web request. So instead of a protocol, I'm going to use generic here, and I'm going to parameterize that type var. And so I can use body type in a couple of different places. So I can define an attribute has that type. I can define arguments on methods have that type. And when we go to actually implement this, it is easier to use inheritance for this. We can go ahead and resolve body type to be, for example, string here. And this is a screen cap from VS Code. Uh, VS Code has PyLance built in. It's a really good tool for um, doing this inline analysis. And so in this particular case, when I hover over the body attribute, I can see that that's resolved to a string. So string doesn't exist up here in reference to body. It does exist here in this parameterized type. 
or a generic type. So here's another example of the same implementation, or a different implementation of the same generic, but in this case, we're going to use a dictionary of strings to anything. So maybe this is a post payload. And we can see, again, PyLance Py or PyWrite, it's one of the two of those, uh, gets it right, and it is a dictionary of string to any, which is defined up here. So uh, for folks that have worked in other languages, this sure does look like Java's parameterized types. So let's talk about like an example of this out in the wild, because I just used this for a big project recently. Um, we refactored a lot of, of our code on SSO about how we fetch user attributes. Um, and so we broke this out into protocols. So we defined, you know, an attribute getter should just be an async function that takes the name of attributes and returns a type. So again, here's an alias. So we can see attribute types is a lot easier and shorter to type in all of this. And it kind of conveys more information than this weird generic um, response building. Oh, come on. Chrome, do the thing. Response building, um, in this particular case, response builders are parameterized. It's a generic on the IDP or identity provider metadata type. Uh, so here's some examples. SAML and OIDC are behaved differently. Um, we can actually put implementation code inside of our generics or protocols. In that particular case, you would want to inherit from it because otherwise it's not ever going to get called. So here uh, we can see we have three different implementing response builders. I didn't really flesh these out all the way. But uh, you have SAML2, a WS fed, and an AuthZ, which is part of OIDC. And so in this particular case, the metadata for both SAML and WS fed behave the same. So I might as well just resolve that in a base class and then inherit that instead. So a little less repeat myself. These are really simple examples. I assure you the stuff in the wild is a lot longer, um, but here's kind of like the high levels of it. And in this particular case, auth Z response looks so different than the others, uh, it needs to define its own metadata and its own response method. How this helps us is it lets us do a factory pattern in how to build or get a response builder. And so in this particular case, this is very similar to how we've implemented it elsewhere. Uh, given an integration type, we can look up that in a registry and then pull out the right class to use and then instantiate that class and send it off. So in this particular case, get response builder given an OIDC request type or integration type, we would expect to get the AuthZ response builder out of this factory. In this other one, SAML2, we would expect to get the SAML2 response builder. Again, this method is all written against simply the generics in all of this. It doesn't care, or generics or protocol, like it does not care about the implementation details. All of that is factored away into this one singular registry. And we can go ahead and we can write methods that, that use these. Okay, so, um, that was my, my quick demo of, or, and talk about uh, advanced typing, a uh, little example of what we do out in the wild. Uh, thank you so much for listening and attending. If you have any follow-up questions, feel free to email me, uh, cvolney at duo.com. Uh, and thank you so much for your time.